Welcome to Under the Microscope. This series is brought to you by the Real Scientists Nano team. Our goal is to provide a platform where scientists can communicate their work and interact with the public. With that in mind, every week we introduce you to a scientist working in the field of materials and nanoscience. Damien Leach, who is a research associate at the Center for Fine Print at the University of the West of England. Hi, Damien. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing good. Thanks. Wonderful. Let's start um, by understanding your uh, research um, journey. So, how did you end up in your current research field? Um, so. Yeah, it's a bit of a strange one. Um, I did my PhD in the theory of 2D materials, uh, graphene, hexagonal boron nitride, all those things, um, and how you stack them up to make nanoscale electronic components. Uh, and it was absolutely fascinating, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, but I got to the other end and was like, oh, I might have, uh, you know, needled in too much. I might have uh, defined myself a bit too neatly. So. I saw um, a job advert for something completely out of my field that I was really interested in, and I thought, I'll just apply to it, see what happens. Mm -hmm. So it was um, in the Centre for Fine Print Research, which is a kind of multidisciplinary research centre uh, that covers everything from art to science, uh, all kind of woven in that thread of print technologies and how we use them. Um, and so it turns out that my supervisor was actually a physicist as well and interested in utilizing these things for fabrication. And so we got on quite well immediately and had a lot of interesting discussions. And yeah, so I now do physics in an art school. That is so cool. That is so cool. It's also interesting that you started off with the 2D materials, theory of 2D materials, because that was also my PhD. Uh, was it? And master's about, oh. yeah. Production of graphene and then application of graphene in uh, biological, like life science applications. But nice. we can talk about that separately. Yeah, definitely. Sounds fascinating. Wonderful. So, um, so you mentioned that you're a physicist in, in an art school. So where does your current research field, so to say, uh, fit in this big picture of materials and nanoscience? Where do you see your current research? Um, yeah, so like I say, I work a lot with uh, print technologies um, and a lot of the ways you stay sane in uh, understanding these things is to uh, understand the materials themselves. So anyone that's ever tried to use an inkjet printer will know very quickly that you, you can't touch the ink. It's, it's a very particular type of ink and made a very certain way. Uh, and this extends broadly as well. So everything from kind of the color uh, to the way these materials flow and their rheological properties, these are all driven by uh, effects at the micro and nano scale. So again, if you start to look at these problems from the bottom up, they kind of allow you to understand what's happening, why, the problems, and how you can solve them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That is, I, I can't stress this enough. This is so fascinating. It's, it's just amazing. It's really amazing. So it sounds to me that you work or worked on a lot of interesting research projects. Um, so if you have to pick one that you're most proud of, or most fun or quirky one, uh, I know it might be difficult because your science is amazing, it sounds super exciting, uh, but if you had to pick one, could you pick one uh, research project or so out and explain it to us in the section we call In Other Words? Sure. Um, I guess it's probably a little bit of recency bias. Um, because it's the most recent thing I've done. But um, So I recently... Uh, undertook this project where we were looking at the, the why, why images look the way they do, uh, why they have the colors they do based on the presence of the pigment there. And there's this really old uh, print technique called the Woodbury type. And it's got a lot of unique advantages, but in essence what it is, is um, you place your paper down and you place a layer of uh, gelatin onto it and you change the print height. So those variations in the print height change the tone because you're trapping more pigment, you know, per Z depth or whatever. Um, so I was trying to do that um, and we'd already looked at a black and white version. So we thought, why don't we expand it to a full color version? Uh, so this is, you know, four layers of colored gelatin all with their own different pigments sat on top of each other. Um, and it seems 
in essence, quite simple to understand because all you're doing is tracking how light moves through these uh, mostly transparent films. Uh, but it very quickly got a bit out of control um, and it became hard to map the theory to the to the actual experimental results. Okay. Um, so yeah, it, it was just a really interesting way of showing that how a really simple problem, like just colors on a page, can very quickly expand outwards into something very, very complicated. Wow, that sounds interesting. So what you did basically is that you put a layer of gelatin and you just apply different pressures at different places and then saw how would the color how the light is interacting with these different uh, layers yeah so it's uh, yeah like i say in essence it's just a difference in the print height so you know it's uh, there's a pigment density and the the higher your print height is the more pigment you'll have to move through for the light to hit the page and come back out um, right. and so you get like a kind of variation in in, in the way the, the picture's printed and the, and the print height across that. So again, it's a release style picture. You know, you can run your finger over it and feel the details, but that also produces the differing tone as well. Was it inspired by something historic? Uh, yeah, so it's it's the Woodbury type process. Um, there's a lot of interesting art history and print history surrounding that process. Um, it's still currently one of the only processes that can produce photographic levels of realism um, with multiple prints, if you know what I mean, in a print style. So you can make a many, many versions of it. It's definitely worth uh, looking into if you get a chance. It's a really fascinating um, look process. And there's not that many out there that are known because people struggle to identify them as woodbury types. They just kind of look like these old 19th century pictures. But the difference is they don't fade because there's no photosensitive component. It's just um, carbon trapped in a gelatin film. That is so cool. That is amazing. Wow. Wow. Would there be any uh, famous painting or art that people might be able to find uh, done with this Woodbury type uh, printing? Am I saying it right? Yeah, so um, like I said, there was a handful of um, studios that did this, uh, one in the UK, one in France, and one in the States. Um, right. I definitely recommend looking up, there's a, a paper done by the Getty Center in America, and they kind of take a scientific look at this process, um, and they highlight some of the really interesting ones. So there's one done by Walter Woodbury himself. Uh, it's basically just a travel book. <laughs> so okay. it's, him, it's him being like, here's a picture I took in in uh, Singapore and here's a picture I took in the Alps and uh, it's basically just his uh, travel guide. It's really definitely worth taking a look into because there's some fascinating pictures in them and the details still all there. I'm pretty sure there's some scans on the internet somewhere, possibly the archive. Oh that sounds cool, that sounds super cool. I hope you, you can uh, shed some more light on the scientific aspect on it when you're curating the Twitter account. Oh yeah definitely. <laughs> Wonderful. I can understand why you took this as the uh, research project that it fits all the parameters I feel. Most proud of, fun, quirky, everything comes together. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so uh, let's move a bit away from the research itself in the lab and other parts of the researcher's life or a scientist's life which is most, uh, most of the times it's teaching. So. Do you teach, and would you like to talk about that a bit? Yeah, sure. So, um, like I say, I work in an art school, so there's none of the kind of traditional courses that I would be able to contribute to. No, no, uh, no maths for scientists or anything like that. Um, but I get to spend a lot of time in the studios and around artists. Um, so that's that's a really interesting process. Is um, I, you know, I tend to be doing experiments in in the studio and prints. Um, and people are always really receptive to just being like, oh, what is that? What are you doing? What's, what's this strange machine that you've got there? And, you know, the ultrasound is making some horrible noise and there's those <laughs> magnetic mixes going around. People are always really fascinated, always willing to chat. Um, and they tend to come away from it being really interested in it. So that's a, a nice way to kind of, um, you know, meet people day to day and just talk about the work that's going on in a kind of non-traditional way. Yeah, that sounds that sounds interesting. That's a different kind of uh, 
Not teaching, but interaction, I would say. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Oh, that's, that's really cool. Um, now let's go back to your research experience for a bit. Uh, I hope your research experience so far has been wonderful. And uh, from what you just said, uh, is wonderful at the moment as well. Yeah. Um, however, if you had three wishes to improve, what would you ask for? And I'm not promising anything here. <laughs> Yeah, so I kind of went with um, three things that I wish, uh, you know, research as a whole would be more receptive to. Um, I would hope that there would be a little bit more support for strange interdisciplinary ideas and approaches. You know, I feel everything I've done in the last couple of years has really been um, pinpointed by the fact that it's a lot of people from differing backgrounds with differing approaches uh, coming together to solve a problem and usually doing it in a very creative way. And I think that interdisciplinary research kind of lies at the center of that. Um, as a kind of um, an attachment to that, maybe a little bit more support for the kind of postdoc RA level. Uh, it does feel sometimes like I'm in a little bit of academic limbo where I'm, uh, you know, I don't have enough experience for 50% uh, of things and I, I'm too far along for the other 50%. So <laughs> you have to strike a very fine balance in between uh, being independent and being dependent and things like that. Um, other than that, I'd just say generally more collaboration overall. Um, people obviously are very receptive to it when you make the effort to come and talk to them about their work and stuff. Um, but yeah, I just think we could all be moving at a slightly faster pace if we were all more open to a bit more collaboration. Okay. Yeah, the, all three very, very important points you raised uh, with interdisciplinary ideas and support for it mainly. I think that is something that will drive uh, more people to do more interdisciplinary work and collaborate more if the support is there. And I guess there would be more support if uh, there was already a lot of interdisciplinary stuff happening. Yeah. So I hope uh, and also support for the postdocs and RAs. I think it's very, very important. Um, I can imagine it being hard that uh, you're really good at some things and you're slightly dependent or halfway dependent on other things, on other people. So it's a balance between yeah, definitely. Being and being dependent. Um, yeah, I can understand that. I wish I could just grant it all. Um, yeah. <laughs> be like, you asked for it, let's go for it. This is what is going to happen. Um, but I would like to believe that we are working towards it, at least the interdisciplinary and more collaboration. Yeah, definitely. And also uh, for scientific careers in general, um, mm -hmm. especially for the early career researchers, I think, because uh, I think it's very, very stressful. Yeah. It's very important. Um, all right, let's, uh, speaking of future, um, what are you most looking forward to in the next three months? Yeah, so um, everything around it notwithstanding, um, I've had a couple of things, a couple of plates spinning over the last six months or so, and I think a, a few of those are about to pop up, so maybe we'll get to talk about it during the week. Um, other than that, there's a couple of funding opportunities I applied to in the last few months, um, and I keep having those, you know, like moments where you suddenly go, oh, did I remember to include this, this thing? <laughs> so I'm hoping I hear back from them soon so I can uh, stop having those moments. Okay, fingers crossed. I hope fingers you get crossed. all the funding that you applied for. And uh, before we let you go, what we understand, what we want to understand from you is, what are the challenges um, faced by the field of materials or nanoscience um, from the fine arts point of view, probably uh, faced by the challenge, faced by the field that the researchers like you are working towards uh, solving. Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I guess what I would say is that uh, a lot of these print techniques, uh, particularly things like 3D printing, they're very reliant on um, a set of material properties um, and a very well understood material such as PLA, um, for instance. PLA? Uh, so polylactic acid is the kind of standard plastic you get in your 3D printer. I think it's uh, derived from like cornstarch or something. But but a lot of kind of 3D printers assume that you're using this material. And so they work in these very narrow set of parameters. Um, and I think it's this, you know, kind of material scientists, nanoscientists, uh, people really understanding materials from the ground up and picking them apart that are helping in broadening that um, and really expanding the range of materials that we can use to fabricate and manufacture with. So do we 
you want alternatives to it or we want more understanding of the PLA? Um, I think it would be good to have, you know, a, a broad range of options because then you can only incorporate more effects and more strange quirks. Um, but yeah, I think it's a case of, you know, really trying to broaden uh, the the materials that we use and then in which case it makes broadening to applications even easier because then you're not limited, for instance, by uh, um, a particular quirky material and the things it can or cannot do. You can start to pick a, a happy middle ground or something like that. Okay, that makes sense. That makes complete sense. Okay, wonderful. Um, it has been wonderful to learn about your science and your scientific journey and your experiences as well. Thank you very much, Damien, for speaking with us, and we are looking forward to having you on the Real Scientist Lab. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. To know more about us, please visit our website realscientistsnano.org and follow us on Twitter at realsci_nano.